Hi, everybody. We're going to give you a moment to join us. We have a, a large group gathering today, so we're really excited that you're all here and really excited that you're um, going to be with us for this discussion. And uh, I want to give everybody just a moment to get settled in um, your Zoom room. Uh, I'm Julie Moose. I'm the executive director of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. Welcome to today's program. Thank you for making the time to be here. We're going to be recording the program and the video will be available uh, later today. And uh, we will share it in our newsletter and our website later this week. So if you miss something or want to hear it again, don't worry, you'll get, you'll get another opportunity. Um, we know you're uh, interested in hearing from this wonderful panel, and they're also interested in hearing from you. So we hope that you will share your questions in the Q&A queue. We will keep an eye on them throughout the program, and we will get to as many as we possibly can. Um, and, uh, and then stay tuned for a follow-up as well. And we will share resources in the chat. Um, there may be many more resources that we can put in the chat, so we will also um, provide those on the page where our, our video is and uh, along with some of the um, slides that some of our speakers will be sharing today too. So with that, I'm really excited to introduce our panel um, to talk about this um, incredibly important subject that journalists and the public have been increasingly attentive to and want to stay attentive to. First, in alphabetical order, we have WAMU reporter Martin Ostermule, who recently co-authored a story on how a panel of high-ranking police officers kept troubled officers on the force in Washington, DC. Next, we have Deborah Katz-Levy from the Maryland Office of Public Defender. She's a public defender in Baltimore who discovered that the Baltimore PD had wrongly expunged discipline records for more than 20 officers. And we have Maryland State Senator Will Smith, a key player in the passage of Anton's Law, a measure that is supposed to make police disciplinary information public, but has had mixed success since it took effect. And our moderator, Miranda Spivak, a veteran reporter who recently published a series of stories about the erasure of civilian criminal records and police discipline records and the dangers these erasures pose to holding law enforcement accountable. So we're all looking forward to hearing the conversation you have planned. Over to you, Miranda. Thanks, Julie. Um, welcome, everybody. And as Julie mentioned, we will be taking questions. So this will, you know, think about, uh, give you a chance to think about what you want to ask. Um, as Julie mentioned, I recently published a series of stories for the McClatchy papers about the risks to police transparency and accountability. And one story in particular was focused on the erasure of police discipline records, which is legal actually in many, many states. And it, but it obviously has an impact on the public's ability and even that of police chiefs and elected officials to ensure that good police officers are rewarded and the bad ones are removed from the force and can't be rehired re somewhere else. So it's really important to have transparency. Um, a recent series of stories by Bill Freivogel and several students of his at, the, at Southern Illinois University, published in the Gateway Journalism Review, and we'll put the link to this in the chat, gives a really good overview of the problems of getting access to police discipline records. 32 states, including the District of Columbia, uh, it makes it, it's impossible to get these records or extremely difficult for the members of the public. And you might recall that if you're a lawyer or a nurse or a doctor and you are disciplined by a public uh, agency or a uh, licensing authority, that information generally becomes public, but police are different. Uh, in Maryland, um, Maryland is one of the states that recently opened up these records and um, However, it's not going too well uh, so far. And there have been sort of outrageous uh, expenses uh, being sought by the policing agencies to make the information public. And the Baltimore Sun recently did a story on all the problems. So why does this transparency matter? Uh, I think we know, but it's always worth reminding ourselves, transparency is a major tool to fight corruption. It deters bad behavior. And it lets people in a democracy know whether or not they're getting a fair, cha fair shake. So I'm going to turn this over to um, State Senator Will 
Smith. He's uh, from Montgomery County, Maryland, a suburb of DC. And he was uh, one of the very key players in the passage of Anton's Law last year, which is the law in Maryland that was supposed to open up these records. It was sponsored by Baltimore Senator Jill Carter and Delegate Gabriel Acevedo of Montgomery County. They're both Democrats. So Senator Smith, who is also in a position to do something about the enforcement of this law, uh, is chairman of the Judicial Proceedings Committee, and he will talk about the law and the problems with compliance and what the legislature plans to do about that. So Senator Smith, you're on. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, always good to see you. And I want to thank Julie and Miranda for convening us and for the invitation uh, for this really, really important and timely conversation and the rest of the esteemed panel. Uh, good to see you both as well, Deborah and Martin. Uh, always good to see. You. I wish we were in person, uh, but I guess the one benefit of doing this through Zoom is I'm, I'm still technically in my slippers, so we've got comfort going for us. Um, but seriously, though, uh, throughout history, there have been tragedies that the press has captured and that have garnered national attention. And, and those tragedies have served as the impetus for broad based national social change. And when I go around talking to groups in Maryland, I, I talk about from George Stinney. Uh, to the lynching of Jesse Washington, to Emmett Till, Edmund Pettus Bridge, and the murder of George Floyd, the press and the press of the day or the media of the day have been uh, able to capture these moments that led to national movements. And when we went through a summer of racial reckoning, we're still very much in the midst of, uh, we're still very much in the midst of a, a global pandemic, but the press was essential in capturing those moments and pushing and agitating for strong and broad-based social political change so I just wanna say thank you to all of you for your role as the, as the fourth estate. So just thank you all for everything you do. And I hope that this uh, conversation today is, is beneficial to you in your endeavors. Um, today, my goal is to provide you with some context of what we did here in Maryland uh, to provide access to some of these records, particularly the disciplinary records of law enforcement officers that were previously considered to be personnel records. Uh, and they were excluded from MPI or MPIA requests, which is the Maryland Public Information Request. Um, so that was just a small part of our landmark uh, police reform legislation that dealt with everything from access to records uh, to use of force. But as you've heard at the top of this presentation, uh, we've had some trouble implementing and having fidelity in, ter in terms of the intent of, of what we did in the legislature. So part one I'll talk about is, is Anton's law or Senate Bill 178, which passed the legislature and we overrode the governor's veto of this bill. And that essentially established that except for a record of technical infraction, a record relating to the administrative or criminal investigation of misconduct by a law enforcement officer, which includes internal affairs, investigatory records, um, hearing records, records relating to disciplinary decisions, is not, not a personnel record for the purposes of the PIA. Um, and therefore the, the records that are, are generally subject to, to discretionary denial at, instead of the mandatory denial, which was the case before we passed this legislation. Technical infraction essentially means a minor rule or violation by an individual, which is solely related to the administrative rules. So it doesn't involve anything like interaction between a member of the public uh, and the individual. It doesn't relate to the individual's investigative enforcement training, supervisory or reporting responsibilities. Um, and finally, that act, Anton's Law, uh, was to be construed prospectively. So to any PIA request made on or before the uh, effective date of the bill, which was October 1st, 2021. And I'm sure that you'll hear from Deborah and Martin since the effective date, uh, they have tried, tried to gain access to records and have run into some significant hurdles. Um, so just a little bit of stage setting as well. Uh, part two of this whole uh, access to public records dealt with the, um, the public access ombudsman. So back in 2015, uh, we established the Office of the Public Access Ombudsman. And this office reviews and resolves disputes between those seeking re records and the custodians of those records. Um, and those disputes would be that that ombudsman had jurisdiction over um, applications of an exemption, redactions of information in a public record, failure of a custodian to uh, produce a public record in a timely manner. Um, or overly broad requests from the public. Um, requests for a denial of a fee waiver, a repetitive or redundant requests and the like. So that was established in 2015. As part of our reforms last year in 2021, um, we expanded the duties of the ombudsman to include resolving disputes relating to fees, which I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about later on, 
Um, we also had that person had now has responsibility for requesting or patterns of requests that are alleged to be frivolous or vexatious or made in bad faith. And then it essentially said that the Office of the Attorney General had to provide a couple of staff members to assist the board and the ombudsman in carrying out their duties. And that has to be implemented by July, 20, July 1st, 2022. So that's, there's still some forthcoming developments uh, with the expanded scope of uh, responsibility for that ombudsman. The reforms also required that each custodian adopt a policy of proactive disclosure of public records available for inspection under the PIA. So that kind of shifts the burden, proactive disclosure. Um, the adoption of the policy, and it did leave some leeway, it could vary as appropriate um, to the type of public record that was requested, uh, the staffing of the agency, the budgetary resources of the governmental unit, those things could all be considered. Um, and, and then it would, it would say, look, you have to include the publication of those records on, the, on a website or a governmental unit to the extent practicable or the publication of prior responses to a PIA request. Um, back again in 2015, we also established a public information accountability compliance board. Um, and that was basically that, that board comprised of five members, which is supported by the governor. Um, and that, that board was intended to receive, review and resolve those complaints from applicants alleging that a custodian of a public record charged an unreasonable seat fee of $350 or more. Uh, again, $350 or more, we'll, we'll get you, I'm sure you'll hear about fees uh, uh, later on in the presentation. So our reforms last year, they left the, the, base, the basic membership unchanged of that board, but the qualifications of the members were modified to require at least two instead of one attorneys that were admitted to the Maryland bar at least one member had to be knowledgeable about electronic records, including electronic storage, retrieval, review, and reproduction technologies. And the act also uh, uh, modified provisions pertaining to the filing of written complaints to the board. So specifically an applicant or uh, the applicant's designee or custodian may file a written complaint with the board if the complaint or the complainant has attempted to resolve the dispute through the Office of Public Records Ombudsman and the ombudsman has issued a final determination stating that the issue is not resolved. Um, and then a complaint, a complaint has to be filed within 30 days after that, that decision had been rendered uh, by the ombudsman. So that's the basic stage setting and the hit in the recent history of our access uh, and, our, and our process to gain access to uh, public records and specifically to police disciplinary records, which are no longer considered to be personnel records. Now, I think the, the legislative intent was clear through our, our hearings and in through the, the plain drafting of the legislation. Now we've got, we're coming up on, uh, we're a little shy of a year of implementation. We've got some things that are still forthcoming in terms of the rollout, but the way that this is, um, has played out and the actual practical application of our, uh, our, our efforts, um, I, I don't think has been adhered to with fidelity. And I think you'll hear a lot more of that from the, the panelists to come. And so I'm looking forward to hearing what the, their practical experiences have been as practitioners and as journalists and going back to work to fix whatever we need to to ensure that uh, we, uh, we have access to those records so that we can restore the trust and the transparency that we all need and want uh, within our law enforcement agencies. So with that, I'll pass the baton back over and just say thank you very much for everything. And, and I can, um, I'll drop my email into the chat if folks want uh, kind of a two pager on the process, I can I can send that to them. Uh, if they Just were. one quick question before we go to Deborah: um, are, are you planning any oversight hearings this year on how the laws are working? So we've, we've got uh, several hearings coming up this week. I'm going to plan something for the middle of the session because I, it is something that the reports that I'm hearing not only that have already been surfacing, that have already surfaced in the press, but the reports that I'm getting from practitioners throughout the state um, have been. Um, jaw dropping. And so it's something that, that we, we need to pay attention to uh, in our 90 day legislative session. We're part time legislature. So we have an opportunity to take quick action, which is something I plan to do. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so on to Deborah, who has uh, multiple experiences in not getting uh, records from Baltimore police. And she can talk about that and also some of the, uh, the ways she's tried to work around it and problems she's encountered. So I'm going to um, walk through a brief presentation to talk sort of about getting records in general and what you're going to look for when you're getting them, assuming folks are sort of everywhere on the spectrum of access to records. 
And I, I should just interrupt for one second to say that the experiences that Deborah has had in Baltimore, as are the experiences of many reporters there, are really universal in their problems. So even if you're not in Maryland, and we expect that most of you are not, I think you know you're going to take from this, uh, you're going to recognize these problems. So when you start to get access to records, most police departments have a program called IA Pro. That's a software that houses records, or they're going to have no software at all and no record keeping. We've partnered with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers to start um, collecting our own data under something called the Full Disclosure Project, trying to keep tabs on law enforcement's records. When you get records, they're going to have lots of numbers. Usually the first set of numbers are going to be the year the complaint was filed, and in each file is going to be tons of media and other documents. Sometimes when we think we're getting access and getting transparency, we're really not because of the way these records are kept. Law enforcement officers themselves categorize a complaint. And so I'm gonna show you some examples. An, an officer who worked alongside an officer on Thursday is now housed in internal affairs on Friday, and will have to pick how their coworkers complaint came in. And they can generally always boil it down to neglect if they want to and hide misconduct under that title. They can also hide complaints under things called VCS, which means a violation of city or state law. And unless you know to look to page 23 of the complaint to find the substance, you might overlook something that says VCS. Dispositions run the gamut from unsus unfounded, sustained, to something called dismissed by legal, which actually in Maryland is not even allowed by statute, but which leads to the illegal expungement of multiple internal affairs complaints. Um, and I would say to look at the dispositions on the records when you start to gain access to them with a grain of salt and understand that they are probably closely correlated to the type or the integrity of the investigation itself. Here's an example of an IA Pro summary report for an officer who was engaged in serious misconduct. You can see this is a 20 something page report. And if I look through very quickly, I see that he has an excessive force complaint, not sustained, discourtesy, harassment, misconduct, VCS. All of these things I'm looking at say not sustained, sustained, unfounded, unfounded, and then judgment of acquittal. Probably because he went to a trial board after investigation and somebody decided to set aside an illegal finding. If you look only at your IA Pro summary report, you're not gonna get very far. But if you look at the substance of the report, you're going to find that this officer was involved in illegally entering somebody's home, taking out his law enforcement issued walkie talkie, beating the daylights out of him and then calling the crime lab to come and take photos. And if you look behind the veil of the report in multiple documents for this officer, you're going to find more of that. You're going to, so I'm, I'm encouraging you to look past the IA Pro summary that law enforcement across this country and in Maryland will give you a summary report that was put into a computer by a law enforcement officer. Getting past another one again, this is another beating that this officer covered up and lied about. And if you look back at the report, it says dismissed by legal. So when you um, go deeper into the trenches of the documents around the reports, that's where you're gonna find what was really happening. Um, for those of you who are really interested in collecting information about corruption, I would certainly encourage everybody to go to the Steptoe report, which just came out last week, the anatomy of the gun ta trace task force scandal. It's an independent report by the Steptoe law firm in DC. And they found certain things about the corruption or the culture of corruption in Baltimore, but what I think is endemic of police departments probably in lots of places. Law enforcement officers were taught to, um, if somebody fle fled them to, to beat them, to send them to the hospital, they found as a matter of course and practice, officers conducted illegal stops, acquired evidence illegally. And it says from this independent report that these practices have long been embedded in BPD's culture and helped to explain this nourishing environment for corruption. The report also talks in detail about how corruption became deeply embedded that it was a common form of corruption to lie on statements of probable cause, to give false testimony, and that this kind of corruption was routine and pervasive, where officers are focused on supporting their arrest rather than being truthful. Um, a survey was done in 2000 for the Baltimore Police Department, and nearly um, 
The police officers believe that nearly one out of every four BPD members, their colleagues, one out of every four colleagues were engaged in stealing money or drugs. And then if you expanded that to include lying on statements of probable cause, the study drafters predict that it would have been a much higher number than that. Um, in the meantime, while this corruption is going on in law enforcement agencies, investigations are housed inside of police departments. And you can see in this independent investigation, internal affairs was reviled and distrusted by the rank and file. Internal affairs investigators received no formal training, um, which further degraded the reputation and discredited their work. Um, officers were allowed to acquit members on trial boards, which is where you go if you contest discipline because of who they knew rather than what somebody did. And in Baltimore, at least, the study drafters found that the system existed, to, that, the, that the system that existed to deter, detect, and punish misconduct lacked credibility in both internal and external legitimacy. And that's important because as you go to get records and we're trying to get to transparency, know that the records that you're looking at are also tainted by the folks who are conducting the investigation. How we got multiple records in Maryland, and if you are in places other than Maryland, you want to team up with lawyers who are filing motions in court to get access to these records because officers testify in cases. Right, go to the hearings, write about the hearings. You're going to help us to lift the veil of secrecy when you attend the hearings and write about them. We draft multiple Public Information Act requests across the state of Maryland now that the law has changed. Happy to provide samples for you. Um, Miranda and, and Julie are going to pass this PowerPoint out afterwards, so you can just pull from the language that we're using. I encourage everybody to join Muckrock, which is an agency founded by journalists to help other journalists navigate public information requests in any jurisdiction in which you are located or where you're seeking information. The fee is nominal, it's at least I think for us, for our large agency and the scale of requests that we want, you can join for free or you can I think it's like $100 a month. Um, and then you can have access to them helping you track and follow up on your PIA requests. And you can search and see other folks' PIA requests for anything that's gone through Muckrock. Um, just to tell you how it's happening in action, we um, have requested PIA, put in PIA requests all across the state of Maryland. Here's an example of a response that we got from the Montgomery County. Montgomery County, we were seeking IED records on these named officers. Um, our response in total, the fee request is $325,218. Um, for one particular officer, the estimate for redaction is $99,500, and that's not even for his paper redaction. And that officer is currently working. I suspect there's something in there we're going to want to go back and look for. Um, when these agencies are coming back to us, and Calvert County asked for $224,000, and then Washington County asked only for $300. This is a document that we got from St. Mary's County where we said, don't just give us a spreadsheet. What at least are the allegations and what are the outcomes and what is the discipline imposed, if any, and we got this for free. And this is information that had never previously been disclosed. Um, we got for the very first time in Baltimore County, a sample of a do not call list. We're starting to put PIA PIA request to every jurisdiction in the state for their do not call list. We didn't even know that Baltimore County had a do not call list. Um, and just to sort of give you an idea to say, well, Debbie, this is a Baltimore problem or we don't really have corruption. This is a cursory search for articles across the state of Maryland over the last year. And you can see articles on police misconduct from PG County, the Maryland State Police, Montgomery County Police, Harford Police, this is out west in Washington County, Anne Arundel County, um, Southern Maryland, Baltimore City, Carroll County, Maryland State Troopers. This is again in PG County. And folks like yourselves who just write about this misconduct help us to continue the fight for transparency. Um, one of the stories that we're hoping somebody would pick up and run with, and I have to do a plug, is that we want these records to be public for everybody not just for even ourselves, public defenders. Our clients interact with law enforcement well before they've been appointed a public defender. Um, we want these investigations to be done outside of police departments altogether. And we want folks like Senator Smith to forward legislation that removes fee requests entirely so that we really are getting these records public. We encourage you to write about it. If you have any questions, here's my contact information and we'll circulate this 
afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just one quick question. Somebody asked in the chat, and I want to get to this right away because I, I had jotted this down too. What is a do not call list? It's also known as a Brady list. This is a list of officers who, for whatever reasons, usually because they've lied somewhere and it's come up either in court or in some other way, uh, that prosecutors don't want them to testify because their credibility will be impeached by the defense lawyers. That's generally what a do not call list is. I don't know, Deborah, if you need to add to that. Okay. Yeah, All right, on to, oh, I'm sorry. The, the key thing is that prosecutor, wow. Prosecutors put together a list of folks who they determine lack credibility sufficient to testify, and they have them pretty much, I think, everywhere and withhold them. Yeah, they do have them everywhere. A lot of prosecutors I've talked to have denied having them, and then a judge will tell me that, oh, yeah, it exists. Um, so, you know, there are ways to get it, and they should be sought everywhere, in my opinion. Uh, on to Martin. Thank you very much for being here, Martin, and some colleagues from Reveal and a colleague from uh, WAMU got a trove of documents, which he'll discuss. Not everybody gets hacked documents. Not everybody's so lucky, but of course you have to verify them too. And he'll talk about that. But why don't you just go ahead with no further introduction. All right, well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, really great to hear both the Senator and Deborah explain kind of their perspectives on this and what's going on in Maryland. Um, I'm a reporter for WAMU, which is the NPR station in the District of Columbia. And recently we, in partnership with Reveal, uh, published a story about police discipline in, in the Metropolitan Police Department here in the district. Basically, there was a trove of documents that came out and we were able to isolate the stuff dealing with police discipline. This is stuff that otherwise we would not have access to because the district does not make these documents public for anybody. Um, and we were able to find instances where there were police accused of criminal conduct off duty. Um, and we were able to follow those cases through their entire disciplinary process. And we found that there were over, over the course of a decade, there were 24 cases where internal affairs wanted to have these officers fired for things for like domestic assault, kind of stalking cases, using their weapons um, while not on duty, that sort of thing. But they were overturned, those, those kind of recommendations for uh, termination were overturned by a panel of other officers that kind of ha have final say essentially on discipline. So we published a story and it was an internal, it was a, it was a first of its kind in, in kind of look at the internal disciplinary system in the Metropolitan Police Department. Again, it's a big topic of discussion across the country. A lot of these internal disciplinary systems are either not public or partially public or made as non-public as possible, even though they should be public. But needless to say, most people don't know how these things operate. Um, what was interesting is like Miranda alluded to this, we couldn't have gotten these documents otherwise. This stuff is not public in the district. We could file FOIA requests until we're blue in the face and we won't get any disciplinary records. Um, the Metropolitan Police Department also, as a matter of course, uh, basically erases or deletes or does away with most disciplinary files after three years. So a police officer gets a misconduct allegation for X, Y, and Z. Three years later, that'll be erased off the record um, as it went through the process. So you know, if you knew what you were looking for and you managed to, 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 to FOIA it, first of all, you wouldn't be able to get it through FOIA, but then you'd have to have it in that three year window, which is, you know, pretty, pretty difficult. So anyhow, we ended up getting the documents because foreign hackers came to our assistance, not that we requested it, not that we wanted this, but basically some foreign hackers um, last spring were able to get into the Metropolitan Police Department's computer systems. They took 250 gigs worth of data, held it ransom, held it hostage for a couple of weeks, tried to get a couple million dollars out of the city. The city said no, and then this stuff was dumped online. Um, I would say a lot of it was just routine kind of bureaucratic stuff you'd find in anybody's computer system. It wasn't that exciting. There was definitely interesting stuff in there dealing with gang databases, how the city manages those, um, emails about how it specialized units operated. There's been a lot of reporting com coming out of that sort of content. Um, but our colleague from Reveal, Dhruv Marotra, who also works for uh, Gizmodo and knows just about everything that you need to know about computers and using computers to sort through tons of information, he was able to search through all this, this massive trove of documents and find the disciplinary files. These are disciplinary files wouldn't, that are never otherwise public. And it, this isn't just a summary statement or kind of a summary report. This is paperwork for the entire process from when an officer is accused of, of misconduct to how their investigation with internal affairs goes, to how their, their, their disciplinary hearing goes, to what the final outcome was. 
So he was able to use his computer skills to sort all this information and kind of give us a trove to work with, which we could then look into and, and basically for the first time ever see what the disciplinary process looks like um, internally. Now, obviously the next step was we just had to make sure this stuff was good, that we, we had to confirm details, we had to get in touch with, with everybody involved to say, did this actually happen? Is this, you know, we tried to get in touch with officers. We obviously told the city, the Metropolitan Police Department. We got no official comment from any official sources, um, but we ended up publishing the story and it, it had a big impact because I think, again, the public is generally aware that police break the rules too, but you never see the, pro you rarely see the process of what happens to them internally when they break the rules. And, and mo most people don't understand what the process is. So this is what the story did and it, it got a lot of attention and now there's, there's kind of increasing calls in the district to not only make police dis disciplinary files public, whether by FOIA or just on a, on a, on a, on a database that the public could access proactively, um, but to also open up the disciplinary process itself, because that was the funny part of it. These, they're called adverse action hearings. This is when a police officer wants to contest a recommendation from internal affairs. So internal affairs says you should be, this officer should be fired. The officer says, I don't agree with that. So they go to this panel hearing with three um, other police officers who ultimately render a decision. Now that, that part is supposed to be public, but what we found in reporting this was that actually finding a schedule of these hearings was virtually impossible. And then actually getting into the hearings was also a pain in the butt. I mean, you could do it if you found the schedule of the hearings, you could get in, but it was, it was, it, it was, it was never made easy. And after we published a story, they've now started proactively publishing a list of, of dates of when these hearings are actually happen so you can actually attend. I mean, you have to announce ahead of time that you'd like to go. They layer on a ton of conditions, including you can't record anything, you can't bring a phone in, you just have to take notes. You're not even in the same room as the hearing, but in a separate room where you're basically just watching a video of the hearing happening. Um, but you know, s slight progress, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I think generally the, the, the story has kind of gotten some more discussion going around what how much of this should be public. And there is potential for change because the, 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 the city police department is now has to start co new contract negotiations. And as with most police departments, all this stuff is, is part of their contract. And so the city passed a law last year, the city council that removes the disciplinary process from contract negotiations. So the police union will not be able to negotiate discipline in its next contracts. Um, and there's also chances, chance for, for other changes to be made, not just because of this reporting, but generally because of the understanding that, you know, it doesn't seem necessarily right nor fair to give police officers that sort of secrecy in disciplinary processes, especially when they're hired to, to, to enforce the law. And then if they break the law, why is it that they get to essentially to do so under veil of secrecy, something, something that's not afforded to, afforded to anybody in the general public. Um, so yeah, that was the experience of reporting it. Again, like I said, we got hackers. To, to, hackers were the ones who put this, these, this information out there. We can have a long discussion about the ethics of, of using documents that are made public by, you know, otherwise at least illicit means. But I think we all discussed it and we said, this stuff is now out there, it was dumped in the public. We encouraged none of that. We did not participate in, in the hacking itself. The stuff is just out there and we should do our due diligence to go through it and make sure the stuff that we find is interesting in the public interest and that we can verify it and that we can build a story around it. And so that was our experience and that's kind of where we are. So did, did you and your colleagues consult with a lawyer about that? Somebody was asking in the chat about, you know, the legality and the risk to you, to WAMU of publishing that. Yeah. I mean, both, both Reveal and WAMU have have legal counsel either in-house or kind of on retainer, but people that we go with go to consistently to check whenever we have even the slightest concern about someone coming back at us with a lawsuit or whether, you know, whether frivolous or otherwise. Um, and the lawyers were like, well, you guys didn't do the hacking. The stuff has been dumped onto the open internet. I mean, it literally is like, it's very Googleable. It's just there. Um, anybody in the general public can look through this. You people do this for a living. It's kind of incumbent on you to use this sort of stuff and use it responsibly. I mean, there was, there was email, there was a lot of emails from specific officers that were included in this trove. And a lot of it was just stuff that like no responsible journalist would use. Like we're not gonna build a story around the fact that a police officer was like, was, was you know, going back and forth with, with his fiance over wedding plans. We're not gonna report on that because that's not something that's of interest nor is it responsible for us to report on. But there are documents in there that are very, very relevant 
to what the police department does and how they interact with the public. But yeah, we definitely made sure to talk to lawyers. And then how do you decide if you've really got everything? I mean, that's the thing about reporting. And I'm sure you know this as well as anybody, Miranda, you always, whenever you're going to finish a story, you're always afraid that you're missing something and you've probably missed something. Yeah. I think we just wanted to make sure that we minimized missing any big things. So we, we reached out to literally everybody um, that we could. Like I said, we obviously tried to get official comment. The city knew that this was coming. They knew that the, what the outlines of the story were. They knew the documents that, that we were looking through. Um, when they wouldn't respond, we were able to find attorneys who worked, who had worked as defense, defense attorneys for police officers. We got them kind of on the record to give us their perspective of, of why the system exists and what the drawbacks are and what the benefits are. Um, so, you know, we just, again, we're, you're always going to miss something. There's always going to be an angle that you couldn't pursue or, you know, the story ended up being 3,000 some odd words. I mean, like we could have got 6,000 if we had really pursued absolutely everything that we wanted to, but we had to just kind of decide this is what the, the heart of the story is and this is what we have and we're going to put it out there and we're going to make sure that we have covered all our bases. What, what advice do you have for reporters who are on this uh, uh, discussion right now about, you know, how do you get the names of the trial boards? Uh, you know, is there any, are there any, are there guidelines that the trial boards use? You know, is that gettable, do you think, in, in a FOIA request or can you ask for that? Well, that's actually, I have this in, in my notes. I've realized, I've been a journalist for about 10 years. The one thing with so many things data related, a lot of times the data, it, it may already exist in the public domain. It's just been buried somewhere and no one knows where to find it. It's just a matter of you looking for it. Or you may actually have access to it without even realizing it. I mean, again, when it comes to police disciplinary files, we did not have access to it, but the city was already legally required to, on a yearly basis, publish a summary of all the disciplinary pro files, uh, disciplinary processes and kind of what the outcomes were. So like, you know, how many officers went through the adverse actions process and, and what was the outcome and what were the charges? Now we realized they hadn't published that information for four years. And then they published it last October. They just dumped it on the, on the city council, which is supposed to oversee this sort of stuff. They dumped it, a, a, a large document of four years of data. Now, again, um, if you know that sort of stuff exists and it does, it should be written in law or regulation somewhere that can help you. I mean, you can say, all right, well, you're supposed to be producing this stuff. Why aren't you producing it to begin with? Um, and it's just the, even with the city is now, the, the, the police department is required to release stop and frisk data. And for years, they just didn't. They just, they just didn't comply with the law. So they were, it took a lot of pressure from the public and the press for that to happen. So I think it's a matter of knowing, knowing what the existing disclosure requirements and laws are and how, they could, how you could use those to your benefit. And also know, obviously knowing the things that you're never gonna get because it's just not disclosable. Like under DC's FOIA law, we're not gonna get police disciplinary files as it's written. Um, Will, in, in Maryland, um, are there, when you talked about proactive disclosure, what, you know, is there any enforcement mechanism for that? No, it's, it's funny that you said that. So the answer is no. And, and you're, yeah, part of the deal was we were, we wanted to shift the burden, right? So that you would err on the side of more information, not less. And so the short answer to your question is no, there isn't. And that's, that's a, a weakness that has, has been exploited and revealed in the first few months of implementation. So, um, you know, that's something that we're gonna have to revisit as a legislature uh, in the sessions to come, so. Yeah, and are the departments gonna say they need more money to do this or? More resources, but also, I mean, look, there is an appeals process, right? That, that folks, the reporters and, and attorneys can go through in the sense, an administrative process, not like a, a court appeals process. But um, as we've seen, uh, it is it has not worked as as uh, as as we intended. So, you know, resource allocation and lack of enforcement. We have police agencies telling us they actually don't even keep these records. So I find that ab absolutely shocking because if police departments are not overseen by an independent board like the Board of Physicians or the Board of Education or Attorney Grievance or Judicial Disabilities. And then you have a law enforcement agency who has a repeat offender for theft, for excessive force, for any other kind of, even down to discourtesy, and they're not keeping their own internal records. Um, the reason I think this is so important is because this is how misconduct escalates and becomes normalized inside of these agencies that are supposed to be enforcing the law. So um, the fact that 
we will keep tabs of these agencies who are telling us they are not keeping tabs on themselves and intend to look for some kind of enforcement for these agencies. Is it in Baltimore, is the city council uh, doing any kind of oversight of this? I wouldn't say the city council is doing any oversight of this, but I will say you can go to the board of estimates and the city law department's website and they will publish um, settlements for lawsuits. And another place where you can go and get information is from the civilian review board's um, website. A lot of times the it's anonymous. It won't necessarily say the party's names or the officer's names, but it's a start where you can match up um, inf numbers with officers. Um, but this is why it's so important for this. And, and another thing to consider is the officer who I showed an example of who had a pattern of beating young black men with his department issued equipment. Then when he left Baltimore, he went to another jurisdiction where he's still practicing. And so this is what we see on, the regu on a regular basis with police officers is they bury their discipline records. And Miranda, you saw that when you were doing your research on the perjury finding for Officer Trotter. And then they go to another, an another agency where that does not follow them. So there has to be a central repository and in independent investigators. If I just may add, I mean, that, that idea was kicked around in the legislature for the MPTSC to be that body, because then they could decertify an officer if they'd been charged and found, um, you know, uh, administratively culpable for whatever the, the, it, they've uh, been charged with. So that the, and then you couldn't district shop. You couldn't skip from Baltimore County to Montgomery County or Howard County. So the MPTSC may be the, uh, the body for that. And that, that idea has been discussed for that. And, and giving them the ability to decertify an officer. So, so an, an, another thing that um, Deborah, your comments are making me think for reporters is that you know defense lawyers know who the bad cops are because often they're up against them, um, and so that is a group of people that reporters ought to be trying to you know get in touch with, um, just even randomly. Well I would be remiss, Miranda, if I couldn't add to that. It's not just defense attorneys who know, it is prosecutors. Well, yeah. And it is shameful when a prosecutor puts a, an officer on the stand. I'm currently working on a case with an officer where two lower level officers reported him for lacking in integrity, racial profile, pro, racially profiling, biased policing practices, reckless policing practices. And you have to dig through 20 something files to find that he was actually disciplined, which I actually got information from a major and a captain, not inside the records. And prosecutors still want to use that officer and fail to disclose that information. And it should not be incumbent on us when we are busy defending indigent people to be accessing, disclosing, uncovering, and disseminating those records. And right. until prosecutors are equally held accountable, we're not really going to get anywhere in this system. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I would encourage every reporter out there to ask the local prosecutor for their Brady list, um, because it does exist. In Maryland, there was a ruling, I think, from the Public Information Board recently that said that had to be disclosed, and prosecutors are beginning to admit that they have them and disclose them. But every prosecutor has these lists. They, they know who they want to call and they don't want to call. Um, there's a question in the chat about um, North Carolina law. I don't, I don't know if any of us are fluent in that, but it says that uh, they've never been able to get information on the why someone was suspended or dismissed. Um, seems to me that depending on how their public information law is written, that you know you ought to be able to get some of those details. But maybe I'm missing something. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. I would that. just recommend starting to put PIA requests through Muckrock um, because Muckrock will give you the resources to help you word, craft the response, um, send it to the right person, understand what the laws are in that jurisdiction. It, it really is a tremendous resource. Um, and the PIA, the, the PIA laws are designed to be, to hopefully to be easy. So there shouldn't be some specific language you need to put in there to just Say, give me everything you got on how they're being disciplined and just keep pushing until you take it through that process. Then another question, Will, for you that somebody is uh, asking how much, or Dan Keller is asking how much consultation did the police unions have as you were working on the legislation with your colleagues, you and your colleagues? One of the guiding principles was just the, the power to convene. So we, we listened to everyone uh, as we were going through the, the process last year. And 
obviously we didn't come down on the same side of the issue as the, as the FOP, but we certainly sat down with them, listened to them. Uh, I, I spent hours uh, with them personally listening to their concerns. And ultimately it came down to a balancing test with whether there's an overarching or overwhelming public interest in having access to these records so that you could discern patterns of misconduct. And then so that you could also hold chiefs and mayors and county executives accountable for that process. If you don't have access to those patterns or those records, then you can't hold anyone accountable um, for patterns of misconduct in certain departments. And so that, that was, for me, that was my, my uh, kind of my North Star in, on, in, in pushing Anton's law forward with uh, Senator Carter. And what about police chiefs and county executives? Where did they really come out on this? I would think it's in their interest to want more disclosure because sometimes the information is even being withheld from them. Well, then, then, then you're on the spot, right? And you're on the spot, then you're, you are then responsible. So it's for us as the public, uh, and as, even as an elected official, you, you want lines of accountability because if, if no one's accountable, if everyone's accountable, then no one's accountable. So you want lines of accountability and that's what that, those records will show you. I will say that in Maryland, you're also, we've implemented, you've heard of the infamous uh, LEOBR that we repealed and replaced with something different. And so we are now in the process of going through those public accountability boards and those administrative charging boards in all 24 jurisdictions, which will lend more public interaction and interface and exposure to the process, but ultimately won't give you access to those records that were supposed to be accessible under Anton's law. So, um, you know, all these things move together, but um, in hearing what I've heard today, some of the, uh, the massive costs and uh, for some of the other roadblocks that have been thrown up, I'm just uh, very disappointed. So it's something we'll definitely have to revisit, even as we continue to unfold and implement the, um, the reforms that we passed last year. Martin, can you talk a little bit about how long it took you all to do that story that you did? And what else you were juggling? Because I know people on this call are saying, oh, yeah, I'm not going to get five weeks to do a story. Well, again, I think the the one uh, the story would not have happened without Drew, who's the the main the main writer of it, who came, who was able to kind of use his computer skills to sort through all the documents and kind of make sense of it. And then he came to us. He came to my colleague Jenny and I, and and we're, since we're both at WAMU, we cover DC on a daily basis. He basically said, "Look, this is what I have. What do you think?" Um, and then it was a matter of like picking the cases that seemed most kind of emblematic of a problem. And and the the lead case was an, a police officer who basically pulled a service weapon on a sex worker while he was off duty. And we're like, that's a pretty stunning case. So we're going to open with that. But then digging into the details, making sure we have everything tied up on that front. So it ended up taking probably six-ish months, I think, um, of, of kind of reporting and making sure everything was in place. Um, and again, it was it was challenging because, yeah, Jenny and I had have daily responsibilities covering everything that's happening in D.C. And she's actually the criminal justice reporter. So she has a ton of stuff on her plate. I covered D.C. politics. Um, thankfully, we had Drew, who, again, was able to make sense of the documents themselves and then took a lead on some of the on, on most of the writing. So obviously working as a team helps a lot. I mean, if this was a, a solo person project and you didn't have computer skills, you could spend years going through documents. And that's the other thing is that. A lot of times, I've, I've, I don't know if they do this as a form of like, oh, you want information, we'll give you information. Like once you actually get documentation, you get stuff dumped on you and you just have to sort through a lot of stuff that's not interesting or not relevant to get the stuff that is. And that can be, if you're just doing it on, 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 on documents that were scanned and aren't, aren't easily kind of like computer readable, you're going to have to print this stuff out and you're going to spend hours doing it. It's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead, Deborah. Can I just add to oh, that? Please. Lots of examples on officers now that we're able to get and publish these records who are allowed, you know, misconduct for engaging in criminal enterprise and still allowed to be employed. And our hope is that we have put together a bunch of these examples to highlight in other jurisdictions outside of DC what records are being kept secret. Because it really is keeping some of it is boring and some of it is I lost my flashlight and some of it is really engaging in just flagrant criminal conduct and allowed to be kept secret and working, so. And, oh, and, and did, go ahead. One quick last thing, and this actually, I think Martin Kosti asked this in, in the chat or one of the questions, just this idea of like uh, a state by state guide of, of all these disclosure laws, like does one exist? Um, yes. The only one I found was WNYC did one back in 2015, which was really useful. But speaking 
you know, it's great to get the, 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 the documents that prove a problem, to prove like something that you kind of thought, like so, so of bad police officers, a disciplinary problem, whatnot. But sometimes even as reporters, stories about the process itself or the lack of access are good stories. I mean, they're not necessarily going to be, you know, it's kind of a one-time story, but at the same time, if you know that your specific jurisdiction has particularly bad laws on disclosure, you can report on it and you can report about you trying to get access to stuff and you failing to get it. I mean, th those are classic, you know, ways to approach the problem and to make it to a certain degree, make it, make the public understand what you're up against and kind of, and make them start thinking, why is it that it's so hard to get this sort of information? Like, look, we all want to get the information, but there's also a good story to be told and how difficult it is to get that information. And if this is what we do for a living and we're having trouble get, getting it, it's, it's, it's worth our while to tell people that at some point. And, and, you know, one of the issues that has always come up in discussions that I've had in newsrooms is, oh, it looks like we journalists are just whining about, you know, how hard it is. So how do you explain, I mean, I obviously, I don't think that's the issue, but in when you're writing or broadcasting a story, how do you convey to the public why they should care? I mean, in a lot of cases, the story, it's like with the story that we did, like the, just setting the, 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 setting the narrative itself or setting the story with a character, like this one police officer who pulls his gun on a sex worker over $30, a, a, you know, a conflict over $30, that alone tells you, like some, we generally would think that the, the public would say, that seems wrong, that seems problematic, that someone who we entrust with the power to arrest us, to, to, to use deadly force is now doing this on his off time to someone who's in a very vulnerable position. Like we, I think that's why the, we like to tell stories through people. I mean, admittedly, that's why processy stories are not nearly as, as kind of compelling, um, though they are worth telling. But yeah, when we when that story was conceptualized that we had so much intimate detail from these hacked documents, it was just like, we have to use this stuff. Um, Deborah, there's a question that you've responded to in the chat, but maybe you can also just discuss uh, with everybody right now, which is Brady lists and can they be hidden in some way by the prosecutor saying it's work product or some other kind of privilege? Work product doesn't trump the defendant's due process right, the right to a fair trial, um, rules that require certain disclosures for discovery. Um, and anything that would be used to impeach an officer or to mitigate a defendant's guilt. So Brady List would really come under that and you don't get to claim work product for something that would, um, at least I, I haven't found a viable argument that they could evade that by work product. They really need to disclose it under Brady and under the discovery rules. And, and if, have you encountered situations where they'll say, we didn't know this either? Um, well, individual line prosecutors will often hide under ignorance, you know, and say, well, I didn't know those records existed for that officer. I didn't know my office required that, but case law in Maryland and laws in other jurisdictions say you are required to know what everybody else in your office knows. And even if you are a government agency or are not allowed to claim ignorance, you are assumed to know everything everybody else in your office knows just for that reason. Um, we have a bunch of resources that we're going to make available because one of the problems I think that uh, news organizations have, especially the smaller ones, is they're kind of out there floating on their own. Uh, Maryland does have an ombudsman, as Will mentioned, and some states do. A lot of states still don't. And a lot of states, if you have an open government, open records request, you've got to go to court if you're stonewalled. And of course, the agencies know that. And they also know you're not going to go to court because you don't have the money or it takes too long or the story is now or whatever. Um, so the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, for example, offers some legal assistance to news organizations. Um, the National Freedom of Information Coalition does. The uh, SPJ has a fund. Society of Professional Journalists has a fund. So we'll put all that um, in the uh, in the chat also and make it available to people after um, we're closing in on the end here but i'm wondering if our speakers have any final thoughts that they want to convey or advice or um, anything well i just wanted to go deborah actually mentioned muckrock earlier like i want to second that and i wanted to kind of tie that into the idea that again 
it's tough out there right now as journalists because there's fewer resources, shrinking newsrooms, all that stuff. But the good thing is that there is a world out there of people who are willing to help. And Muckrock is an example of journalists willing to help other journalists. But, you know, we manage this story because Reveal came to us and said, we've got a lead on something. What do you think? And I think partnering with other newsrooms and partnering with, with other very specialized news outlets um, can be really great. And because it, it gives you gives you the best of both worlds. I mean, Drew from Reveal came to this. He's not in the district. He's in New York. So he came to it. And he's like, I think I have something, but I need you to help me fill in some of the gaps. And that's what we, we were able to do. And it also he came at it with a non, with a very critical non-local eye, which was helpful to us. Because again, sometimes you get lost in the weeds of the stuff that you cover, and it's good to have someone from outside tell you, "Look, I see something here that you may have missed just because you're so enmeshed in this on a daily basis." So I think finding help out there um, is important. And it, even though there's fewer journalists out there, unfortunately, and fewer resources, I still think there's like a world of people out there who have incredible skills that they're willing to share for a good cause. Will, any parting thoughts? Sure, I'll just say that you know, access to information about how your government works and uh, your ability to synthesize that information and present it to the general public so they understand how their government works is foundational to the success of our system of governance. And so the work that you're doing, uh, Debbie, Martin, I mean, the, the work you all are doing is instrumental for helping me, a legislator, make the case for legislative change. If we understand it, you're able to document that something's not working, um, the PowerPoint presentation today, pretty compelling. Um, so the, I mean, these are these are great resources for legislators to be able to make change. So just I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing, and and um, yeah, I look forward to working with you all in, in the months to come and during our legislative session. And I guess that's also a, a call to others who aren't in Maryland to get in touch with their uh, sympathetic legislators and and provide them with uh, your stories of woe. Debbie, what's your uh, parting thought? Well, I just wanted to thank journalists who help, you know, as a public defender, most of the time we're really sort of banging our head against the wall to give voice to underrepresented people and to bring life to. You look at the entire Stepto report, what's missing from that is on every side of every the other side of every time there's an instance of police violence or misconduct is a person whose life has been either destroyed or interrupted significantly. And so to the extent that journalists can use their power to continue to give voice for our clients and citizens across the country who are victims of police violence and misconduct is so powerful. And I just want to say thank you because you have significantly helped to move the ball forward. Thanks. Julie. Miranda, do you have any final thoughts you wanted to share? Um, well, I think thank you to our panelists who I think were, were very helpful, informative, and I hope we've informed the discussion a little bit around the country. Um, we do have somebody was asking for a list of um, state laws on police disclosure and that does exist in a couple of different formats and we'll get that out as well but you know thanks to our panelists i think you know obviously we couldn't do this without you it's been extremely informative from my perspective we'll see what the audience has to say about that well, thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, our panel. I learned so much from all of you, and I know the participants did too. Um, thank you all for the great questions and for spending the hour with us, and stay tuned for a follow-up hands-on workshop. Um, we hope that you um, got something of value from this and that you will support our work with a donation. The link to donate is in the chat or will be shortly. Um, stay well, and uh, thank you all again for being here, and we hope to see you soon. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye.